Hello, hello. Hi, everybody out there. I'm Shane Dubow for the Levy Senior Center Foundation. And I'm happy to welcome you all today to our Levy lecture with my good friend, Jill Riddell. Jill is here to talk about the leading role older adults can play in the face of existential concerns such as climate change. How can we all stay sane while also figuring out what we can each do, if anything, about a problem as big as climate change? That's one question Jill is going to address today. But another sort of implicit question is what is the unique role older adults can play as heads of families, heads of organizations, as mentors and role models? What is the unique leadership role older adults are so well positioned to play on an issue as big as climate change? But first, a bit about Jill. She is a Northwestern graduate. She has worked at a number of environmental nonprofits in Chicago, the Nature Conservancy, Open Lands, and the Notabart Nature Museum, where we actually worked together for a few years. Jill now sits on the mayor of Chicago's Nature and Wildlife Committee. She teaches writing at the School of the Art Institute. She hosts a podcast on cities, nature, and people called The Shape of the World. Subscribe to that wherever you get your podcasts. And she is the founder of a writer's studio called The Office of Modern Composition. Um, but perhaps my absolute favorite Jill Riddell credential is she actually once discovered a new species of mushroom. And if I'm remembering this right, um, she got to name it. So we can ask her questions about that after her presentation. Um, after Jill presents today, um, she will answer any other questions you might have. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions at any time. Please do not use the hand function. We can't see when you're raising your hand, so use the chat function instead. This Levy Lecture is made possible by the Levy Senior Center Foundation and the City of Evanston. As always, the Foundation appreciates your support as we continue to work on behalf of our community of older adults. Take it away, Jill. Thanks, Shane. And hi, everybody. As Shane said, the subject I'm gonna to address today is how older Americans can lead during an era of existential threats. And because the existential threat that I understand the most deeply and thoroughly is climate change, I'm gonna be referring to climate change a lot. But really this puzzle of how to be effective, how to lead, and the solutions I'm proposing are things that older adults can extend to other things beyond just climate change. It works for other types of issues as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, climate. Well, for the Earth's atmosphere, it's been a pretty exciting year so far. And we're only three quarters of the way through it in 2023. And the United States has already set a new record for the number of weather disasters in a single year that cost $1 billion or more. And you probably have your own list of greatest hits, but here are a few that come to my mind. One is what happened in Maui, um, a huge unprecedented drought contributed to the fire that wiped out the city of Lahaina. Californians this year experienced their very first tropical storm or at least for most Californians, it was the first one since it was the last one that the last one happened over 80 years ago. That was Hurricane Hillary, this weird thing that happened on the West Coast. And Hurricane Hillary was following up what had already been a record breaking year of rains and floods throughout the state. Louisiana, state of Louisiana had more days this year when the temperature exceeded 100 degrees than it's ever had before. And then man, poor old Phoenix. Phoenix had more days when the temperature went over 110 degrees. Um, I can't even really imagine what 110 degrees feels like even for one day, but they had 54 of those days, which is basically two months. That's one sixth of the year with the temperatures of 110 or more. And here in Chicago, we are a little more sequestered from those things since we don't live in an area that is primarily desert or we, and we don't live on the coasts. Um, so the only climate change that event that really had any direct impact that I was able to observe was uh, in August when we got those yellow skies for a few days and there was that sort of acrid smell of burning in the air. That was coming from the wildfires that were in Canada and Canada had one heck of a year. Um, 
Every, each of the 13 provinces had a record-breaking wildfire in it sometime between the uh, month of March and um, up until the present. Honestly, it's no wonder that people are now being diagnosed with what a condition that psychologists are calling eco-anxiety. There was an article in the New York Times just a couple of days ago about this, um, and it described the eco-anxiety as a chronic fear of environmental doom. And it said it, that it's characterized by feelings of frustration, powerlessness, feeling overwhelmed, hopelessness, and helplessness. Those are five things that I'd like to never feel again in my life, and I imagine you would too. Um, but it's understandable that a lot of people are gripped by that, given what we're dealing with. So part of my intention with this lecture is to help with that. I'm hoping that today's talk will either cure you of your equal anxiety if you already have it, or even better, prevent you from ever suffering from it. So here's what we're gonna go be doing together today. First, we need to cover some basics. So the basics are, number one, what is an existential threat? And since we're gonna focus on climate change, what is climate change? Number two, in this context that we're existing within today and within the realm of this talk, what do we mean by leadership? Number three, how to shape our course of action, how to determine in advance what your own personal parameters are and what criteria there is for deciding how much it's right for you to undertake. Number four, a description of my recommendation for appropriate action. And five, who are the people that you might potentially lead and influence? If you're interested in taking a leadership position, there needs to be some people who are receptive to that and ready to be led and that you're in a good position to do that for. So we're gonna talk about that. All right, let's get going. This existential threat isn't gonna solve itself. So first, what is climate change? Eventually, the solutions we're gonna talk about require that we're all on the same page. And many of you probably know a lot about climate change already. You could probably be giving this lecture on uh, climate change. Um, other people, though, it, I, I'm sure you have a, sort of a general understanding, but it's important to sort of know something about the chemistry and the physics and the, just the basics of it, because our, in order for our solution to make sense. So um, I'll tell you just my super short version, which is that basically we live on the surface of the earth. We have these several miles of atmosphere between us and outer space that protect us from this, um, the the rays of the out of being in outer space. Um, and on the surface of the earth, um, we are emitting what we're calling greenhouse gases. I'm going to sometimes use the word CO2 interchangeably with greenhouse gases. So that stands for carbon dioxide. But in fact, there are other kinds of greenhouse gases as well, but I'm just using that as a shorthand. So the greenhouse gases, at the, much of it's natural and normal. However, human beings have added greatly to the amount of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. And that's why we're experiencing this runaway climate change at this stage, um, or trying to prevent runaway climate change. We're experiencing some climate change already. So um, let's take a look at this short video, and it'll explain it a little bit more, and then we'll get down. Thank you. One thing that makes life on Earth possible is a thin layer of gases called the atmosphere. It holds in the air we breathe and protects us from the cold of outer space. When energy in the form of light reaches us from the sun, it streams through the atmosphere, making plants grow and lighting up our days. In addition to light, the sun also delivers heat, which warms the planet. But much of that energy is reflected back towards space. Fortunately, though, the Earth's atmosphere works like a blanket, preventing a lot of heat from escaping. In fact, if the Earth didn't have its atmospheric blanket, its average temperature would be about minus 18 Celsius, or zero Fahrenheit. Brrr. Thanks to the atmosphere, the Earth's average temperature is a much more livable 15 Celsius, about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the gases in Earth's blanket is called carbon dioxide, or CO2. Carbon dioxide is everywhere on Earth, actually, and it's an important part of Earth's delicate balance of life. It's what animals, including us, exhale after they breathe in oxygen. Plants then use carbon dioxide, along with sunlight, to grow and make more oxygen for us to breathe. A lot of carbon dioxide is also absorbed by the oceans. 
the carbon dioxide that's left over floats up into the atmosphere and helps form our planet warming blanket. But there's a problem. Scientists have observed that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been steadily rising over the last hundred years, soaring high above anything the Earth has seen for hundreds of thousands of years. All the plants in the world, as well as the oceans, can absorb all the extra carbon dioxide in the air. So consider this. Have you ever put on too many blankets at night? If you've woken up hot and clammy, then you know how the Earth feels when it has more carbon dioxide than it can handle. Scientists now know that excess carbon dioxide and some other gases in smaller amounts are preventing heat from escaping. And this is warming up the planet. They call it the greenhouse effect. Remember that graph of average temperature rise since 1880? Check out this graph of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere since 1880. Now let's look at them both. See how they're rising together? That's because as carbon dioxide goes up, the temperature does too. They're directly connected. In the next video, we'll take a closer look at where all this extra carbon dioxide is coming from. Great. So now you have the basics on carbon. Yeah. Now you have the basics on climate change. Um, so the one thing I would add to that is that we also should probably say something about the word existential. Existential means a threat that threatens the very existence of life on Earth. Um, or in some cases, it might be talking about um, the an individual life. In this way, we're talking about collective life. There are other uh, existential threats as, as uh, besides climate change, as Shane alluded to. And I would also put in this category, although they're not existential threats, things that you think that are very disruptive to our society that are issues you wanna work on. I feel like the kinds of solutions we're talking about here can apply to those as well. So number two, leader. The word leader means different things to different people. A leader is someone who definitely has influence and perhaps they even have some authority over other people. And I think about a high school clique and in a high school clique, um, the leader of that clique definitely has influence on other people, but they don't technically speaking have any authority over them in the sense that nobody's declared any laws. They haven't made up set rules that give that person control over the behavior or actions of anyone else in the group. Um, and that model is really how most of our associations, including as we become older adults, they function in that way. Someone who is older might be a leader in, in a similar way, a role model within their community, within a group of friends. Um, and, in, um, and that, in fact, that's somewhere where an older adult actually might have an advantage and that you know more people at this stage of life. Um, and oftentimes you've been around within a group uh, that you've risen to a position of leadership already. The head of a household is an example of a leader. So is the head of a small business or a union. Oftentimes through a mix of perseverance, sticking things out for se several years and the knowledge that comes from that, it really comes to bear now. And maybe for many years, you've been active in and out of an official leadership role, uh, in a club, a synagogue, a church, a mosque, a sports team, a book club, you know, and sometimes a person isn't technically in charge of anything at all, but whenever she or he speaks at a gathering, everyone in the room tends to turn their direction. And when you're thinking about becoming more of a leader, it's important to recognize the power you already possess, and that's already implicit within your social groups. So, I've grouped leadership on climate into three categories. And the first is the one that comes most readily to mind when the word leader comes up. And we often think about leaders far away from us, um, national and global influencers. Within this group are individuals who maybe are already famous for something else, and they speak out about climate change. I think about the actors Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Ruffalo. Those are two people who are both very serious about climate change and have done a great deal to make a difference. Prince Harry is also in that category. Um, and then there are people where the only reason that they are famous is because of their interest in the environment. David Attenborough, for example, the maker and narrator of so many films about nature. And Greta Thunberg, the 20-year-old Swedish woman who a few years ago when she was only 15, she captured our imagination by delivering this really moving, rousing speech at the United Nations Climate Summit. 
Then there are influencers on social media like TikTok, Hazel Thayer and Sabrina Pear, to name just two. And those are the kind of leaders who are the most well-known. And people like that tend to be the kind of leaders whose names come to our minds first, but that doesn't mean that that's the only kind of leadership that matters. Not by a long shot, thank goodness, because most of us are gonna fit into the one of the other two categories. So let's talk about that second category. In the second category are leaders who care about a certain issue enough that they start to commit to it and they start working on it probably as a follower first, a participant, someone who's learning more about the issue. And then gradually over time, they rise in importance within a nonprofit organization or maybe local government. And I happen to think that one of the best actions a person can take on climate is simply to show up at their city government meetings and pay attention to what is going on locally. So much of our attention is sucked up by the national news. And maybe at first you just show up at a, a, lo at a local meeting and get the feeling of the room and start to learn the issues without saying anything at all. And over time, start to stand and speak up and then ask questions. So before I came on this, uh, I got into this webinar, I took a look at the city of Evanston's website. And tonight there's a meeting of the Housing and Community Development Committee at seven o'clock p.m. And I might mention that worldwide out of all the greenhouse gases that escape into the atmosphere, 40% of those come from our buildings. So having voices who consistently show up at such a meeting about housing and buildings and press for measures that reduce the carbon footprint of Evanston's buildings could have a huge impact. Show up there and speak for climate initiatives. In the second category, you start on the path to becoming a leader by first becoming a participant. And now we'll show our second video. This is a video of Evanston residents who fit into this second category of leaders in a very interesting way. Um, basically, that video shows a couple of people that are active in Evanston, and if we get it up a little bit later, we'll play it, and if not, I think you sort of have the general idea about this second category of leaders. They're the people who participate in projects that others may have started, and then by continuing to show up for things, they start to assume a leadership role. Others, they might find a niche that's not yet occupied by another organization and start their own. Um, but mostly the people in this category are people who at first made themselves present and eventually they made themselves heard. They get up, they dress up. More and more people are understanding the challenges of climate change. And as Evanston rolls out its net zero plan, solving the climate crisis will require cooperation from people of all ages. Every generation has their own unique way of engaging. Jerry Garl is the leader of the Evanston Environmental Justice Program. She spent her career at the EPA and has lived in Evanston for the last 40 years. She's noticed an uptick in involvement with climate activism. I don't think people started taking it seriously until I think the last 10 years. When people start dying, you, you really you know, say, okay, something's, something's going on here. Garl says the attitudes of people from her generation led many to deny the existence of climate change altogether. I'm a baby boomer. It's a generation of people who, in general, not, not universally, questioned authority, leading to whole groups of people who, who believe, I would say, non-factual information. If you had asked me 30 years ago, I would have said, this generation gets it. We were there on the first Earth Day. But as it turns out, not everyone does feel that way. Despite their denial, Garl has kept fighting. Her motivation? I've got two grandchildren. I cannot imagine not working as hard as possible to make it possible for them to have a full life. I mean, your grandchildren are going to be the beneficiaries or the sufferers of the decisions you make. Sylvia Wooler agrees. She's the founder of the sustainable company Remake Architecture. Her twin boys are what inspired her to start Evanston's District 65 Climate Action Team, a partner organization with the school system that educates and engages kids with sustainable practices. I had always thought of them being my little eco-warriors. And so I started working with other parents from D65 and within the community to 
be proactive in reducing waste and encouraging composting. Wooler says sustainability was also not a part of the conversation at home growing up. She's trying to change that with her kids. Well, my eyes are more open, so it's hard not to open their eyes to it. Like, we talk about it all the time. You know, they would never throw food away. With them, I think it's very much a given that it's, this is what we talk about, this is what we do. Wooler is taking these ideas to D65. With the composting, we thought that was a good way because parents could get involved. I've had many parents and kids come up to me um, throughout the years and say, you know, we're we're composting at home because of what the kids are doing at school. Milo Slevin is a junior at Great. So you sort of have the sense the sense of that. Um, that video goes on from there to talk about an initiative at Evanston Township High School that's called E Town Sunrise that's always doing good things. They're good examples of that second good category of leadership. Now, the third category of leaders consists of a group of people, those of us who care and we want to make a difference, we do care about climate change, we'd like to be doing something, we'd like to be convincing others to do something, but maybe we don't see ourselves starting an organization or running for local office. We want to continue to lead our lives more or less as we do now with the addition that we will come up with a system where we're doing our fair share for fighting climate change. And when opportunities do come up for us to share that information with other people about what we're doing and talk about what they might do, we'll definitely do that. And this is a kind of leadership. It's a kind of leadership that is quiet and consistently effective on a small scale. And honestly, most of the change in slowing down climate change can come from this level of effort if enough people do it. And now I'm going to tell you a big and important secret, and it's not meant to be kept secret, but actually not very many people really know this, realize it, and act upon it. But Shane mentioned that he and I worked together at the Nature Museum, and while we were there, we were lucky enough to have some coaching from a woman named Carol Saunders, um, who had invented this field of psychology um, that really gained traction around that time. It was called conservation psychology. And conservation psychology is about studying the relationships that humans have with the rest of nature with the goal of encouraging conservation of the natural world. And in her research of trying to figure out what made a difference for people to go from not caring at all about nature to caring just a little bit about nature and the number one nature way that somebody goes from caring about nature to taking action to protect it is not because someone scares them into it. It's not because Prince Harry likes it and they like Prince Harry, although that helps. It's because someone that they know personally or someone within their community influences them to care. Or sometimes they move to a different community and everyone there is very engaged in that issue. So they become engaged in that issue. So it's not desire and it's not fear. The principal prod that really makes a person change a habit is peer pressure, that innate yearning we all have to fit in. So I'm gonna give you an example that has a great data set behind it to really prove how effective this is. In 2007, the state of Illinois passed a law that required energy utilities to promote energy efficiency. And um, they have, were supposed to do this through whatever kind of programs they could come up with, but they needed to be proactive in promoting energy efficiency. So based on that conservation psychology research and also on research done by economists, ComEd initiated this one change, which I'm confident that you all noticed because you would have been around to see what the uh, electric bills and uh, looked like before this. So if you live, live in Illinois, probably you've noticed that when you receive a bill from ComEd now, it doesn't just tell you how much money you owe. It also tells you about the energy level that your, uh, your neighbors are using. So it compares your energy use to your neighbor's energy use. And this one simple change, which plays very, very strongly on our human desire to fit in with others, and maybe even to compete with them a little bit, um, has been hugely effective at cutting energy use in Illinois. After utility customers were told how much energy their neighbors used, the overall, the average uh, energy use in those high households, especially the ones that were using more, declined by 1.2 to 2.1%. And those savings are sustained for periods of many months, meaning it, takes, it continues to be effective even after the initial shock of the comparison wears off 
it continues to work. We care what other people think. And when you think about how you're going to be a leader, you're gonna make use of that piece of bit of knowledge. All right. Third, how do we determine how much is enough for one person for you to do? Because honestly, most of what you read about the environment and the climate, it gives you an infinite set. There is no much, there is nothing you can do that will ever be enough. And that's very demotivating because if there's not, an, not enough, if there really is not, it's not possible to do enough, then why do anything at all? And frankly, I also believe that that's not factual. Climate activists are gonna take all they can get from you, but they don't have any way of knowing what the recipient of their messages are capable of providing, interested in providing, um, what other demands they have on their time. So you're the only one that can know that about yourself. So the people that are delivering these messages about do more, do more, do more, do more, do more, keep doing more, they don't, they don't have the information that you have. You have different data than they do. You already know what other issues you care about deeply and may already be working on. You also may know that you're in a particularly busy time period where maybe you're caring um, for somebody else who's ill. Maybe you've got a new grandson or a granddaughter that you're taking care of. Um, you know, I don't know what those demands are, but they can be infinite, right? But you know whether you've got room to do a lot, a medium amount, or a small amount. That choice is yours. And don't let the let climate activists, including me, convince you that you're never doing enough because it's possible to do enough. And that's what we're gonna explore right here. My advice is to evaluate this, uh, the issue of climate change calmly, coolly, rationally, to maybe set aside 90 minutes to two hours sometime this week to really think about what it is, how it fits into your life and how you might make a change. And specifically, I hope you'll consider the recommendation that I'm gonna make in a few minutes of how to do this. The criteria to use are, okay, well, if every single person in the world took the same action I did, would that be enough to solve the problem? If not, then maybe that's your solution isn't enough. So if you say, well, I'm gonna recycle one can one time in my life, that's going to be my contribution. If you multiply that times 8 billion, that's not enough to solve climate change, right? Um, and if my action, and if so if everyone did it, then it's, and deciding that is, um, it, you know, is how, trying to find that right size. So we know that that's going to be too small. Too big is if it strains you too much, if it taxes you too much that you give up on it. It taxes you so much that something else in your life is suffering or someone else in your life is suffering because of it. So we're looking for, I'm, I've got Sweden on my mind because I'm going to go to Sweden tonight. I have a plane leaving from O'Hara at 945 tonight. Um, and they have this word called logum that means not too much, not too little. That's the kind of a solution that we're looking for here. The bare minimum where the problem of climate gets solved and um, that you, you're, it works in well to your life in a way that you can remain tranquil inside and feel confident that you're doing what you can. Okay, so that's the criteria. Number four, the fourth thing we I said we had discussed, and here's where the rubber meets the road. This is the solution. First of all, I believe in systems, not one-offs. And so I'm gonna have you consider taking two actions. The first action of this plan is one that will happen right away. And this one, you're gonna repeat it annually once a year for the rest of your life. And that is this, you are going to purchase a carbon offset credit. In a minute, I'm gonna explain more about that, but I'm gonna tell you the second part right now too. Number two, you are going to select an option and add that for action that requires daily vigilance, maybe some days more than other, but you're gonna make a single change of behavior that matters. You're gonna make that decision, tackle it and stick with it consistently for a very long time. It's gotta be something that reduces the amount of emissions that you personally are responsible for creating. Okay, the carbon offset. 
this is a little bit complicated, but not terribly. Basically, you are trying to balance the scales. So if you are doing activities as all of us are because the infrastructure of the world forces us to, we can't not emit uh, extra amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So as you unbalance the scales, um, the carbon offset uh, the carbon offset credit that you purchase will rebalance the scale. And the money that you use that you spend on the carbon offset credit is going to go to a company or an organization specifically that develops these kinds of projects. They are forestry projects that are putting more trees that absorb more carbon dioxide. Um, they are some mm, companies do things collecting refrigerants and making sure that those are not reaching the atmosphere. There's a variety of things that those kinds of projects can be. Um, we're not going to do a deep dive on that here, but essentially it's almost as if, like in my mind, I feel as though the government probably should be taxing us for that. Um, but since they're not, since it's left up to us, purchasing the carbon offset takes the place of that. It means that you're doing collectively something for the collective amount of greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere. You're doing something to reduce that, to bring that down. All the projects that those kinds of organizations do have to be additional. They can't be things that would be done otherwise. They're purely incentivized by the fact that there are corporations, nations, the nation of Switzerland, for example, buying all carbon offsets so that they can be carbon neutral and individuals do the same thing. What Basically how you do that is you go online to one of these companies. They'll ask you questions about like, how much do you drive? How large is your dwelling? You know, um, and then they estimate your carbon footprint and give you an amount. I think households generally range from something like 100 to $300 a year. Um, and now's the time that I should say, absolutely, if you could not afford this, do not do it. But if you can, it is something that it writes the scale. You will, at that point forward, you will have a, an, uh, you will have erased your carbon footprint, that you will have erased the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that you're emitting that are going to the atmosphere. You'll have compensated for them by buying the carbon offset. The second step of this is, is around your personal action. And one of the places that I think people get really paralyzed is when they look at all the options there are online of all the things they can do for the environment. And there's nobody to really curate that for them. So I have a very specific recommendation on this as well, which is I'd like for you to look at a website that's called Project Drawdown. Project Drawdown. It's a nonprofit organization that seeks to help the world reach this, this um, place that scientists call drawdown. Drawdown means a time in the future when levels of greenhouse gases have declined enough, uh, have stopped climbing enough that they, and then actually started to decline. So not only are they not rising anymore, but they're actually going down. That's what we all want to have happen, what we need to have happen, and what has to happen for the earth to continue as we know it now. Project Drawdown, that organization is a major hub for how we're going to get there. It's a real, like it's a... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of the uh, original, the the one, the source that experts draw on themselves um, for talking about those actions, rather than just giving you a whole book full of ideas. My recommendation is that you choose something that's on the very top of the t uh, the project drawdown list, um, in the top ten, um, and the item that you choose has to be an action that you have control over that you don't have to ask other people for permission to do. Ideally, it's one where you're not inconveniencing the people that you live with too much. Um, your household may or may not go along with it. Um, but you know that you are doing your share as an individual. And the last point, the fifth thing. Who are the people that you might potentially lead and influence? So you are implementing your own solution you're starting to develop this sense of calm about what you're doing because you know you're, you're taking action and it's action that matters. And it may be, need to be tweaked over time. It may not be exactly what I suggested, but you know you're doing something. You're doing something that you've determined to be enough. Now, who are the other people that you might potentially lead and influence to do the same? So out of everybody in America, <laughs> There's a small group, it's about 16% um, of people who don't believe that the climate even is warming. I think those people are gonna be very hard to 
reach for most of the people who are listening to this lecture because you're already pre-selected to be people who are interested in climate. Um, they tend to belong to kind of insular communities. Um, they're hearing mostly from people who believe very similarly to the way that they do. Um, they may be cut off from divergent opinions um, and that makes them hard to reach. Um, I will say though, that if you're lucky enough to be related to somebody like that or have a loved one in that category, that's actually really great because over time with love and care, you might be able to talk to them about this and it might make that tiny, a tiny little difference and that would be great. But more, the people that you're gonna have a better chance at and you might as well go to the, the place where you're gonna have better luck, right? Is um, that 70% of Americans do understand that the climate is warming and they are your main target, the ones you're most likely to have success with. And what you're gonna be doing is not thinking about moving them the way I feel like I in the past as an activist used to do, which is this is happening, our hair is on fire and you gotta act now and you've gotta do everything um, and blow a gasket and do everything right from this point forward. It's really about thinking about how to help just move them like a little bit incrementally each time. So not moving people from A straight to D, but A to B first. And then over time, B to C. And over time, maybe your influence and they start hearing other influences, move them from C to D. That's what we're after here is an incremental approach. And don't let perfection be the standard by which we judge our efforts. Often we want somebody to go from being a non-believer to someone who marches in, in the climate marches like the one that was in uh, New York City yesterday. Um, so think about the small change Sunday, I guess it was. Remember that fear isn't effective and neither is the guilt trip and continue with your own consistent efforts using those, those groups that we talked about that you might have influence over. And I would say that the, the, this quiet, effective route where you think about what's possible for you and maybe even stretch yourself to do something that feels a little bit more than what's possible. You purchase the carbon offset, you create one action that you really focus on, get to know well, become good at, that you can consistently do over time that makes a significant difference in how many gases are actually leaving the earth and going up into the atmosphere. And you start to feel that there are satisfactions with this kind of a life. A, you don't have to be one of those people that every time there's a warm day in January, which frankly, we've been having the whole time I've lived in Chicago, which is 30, 30 years, you get that occasionally weird day and that's warm in January. You don't have to freak out about it every time because you know you're doing your part. And it, there's a certain sense of confidence that you know when you're doing your part, you've studied this issue in this calm period that is detached from being triggered by a news item, but really set aside that 90 minutes or two hours to figure it out for yourself and decide what you're gonna act on and, and take care of it and get it done. When you speak with others, they can feel that you're fully engaged in doing your part. And it's helpful to people in a very tangible, real way too that um, you don't have any more hand wringing that you're doing, no more eco-anxiety, and you're modeling that as well. It's a really important thing to model for those of us who are younger, who are still in that kind of state of, uh, 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 you know, about life in general, and there are many things to be anxious about, like to, to know that you can take some control over some parts of this. You can't make change climate change. You can, can change your, but you can change your contribution to climate change. You're controlling the part you can control. And that anxiety is misplaced worrying about the parts that you can't. The downsides of being quietly and consistently effective is that you're probably not gonna meet Greta or Leo or Prince Harry, and maybe you're not gonna win any prizes or honors or have somebody make a video about you, but you are genuinely doing your share. Earth is better. And if every one of the 8 billion people on earth followed your example, the problem would be solved. The world needs you and you need it. Let's keep the earth livable. Do your part and be a leader. If only one other person follows your example, then you've doubled the number of people who are doing as you're doing. And in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with three words. My hope for you as you move forward confronting existential problems, the one of climate and other tough problems in the world, that you will be that quiet and effective leader. 
And with it, you will be calm, systematic, and unstoppable. Thank you, Jill. Fantastic. Um, so for all, um, all of you out there in the audience, remember the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is where you can ask questions. Um, we have a few, but I'm going to give a few more minutes if you want to um, send in some questions now. And Jill, in the meantime, I want to ask you a few questions um, <laughs> really quick, just because most of us have not yet gone to the Project uh, Drawdown website. And by the way, for everyone out there, um, that website is drawdown.org, D-R-A-W-D-O-N.org. Drawdown.org. So if I did go there, um, what, what, you know, just what's some really tangible things on that list of people like you and I could, could do to kind of help? That's a great question. And partly why I didn't put it in my talk is because that is available in other places. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of get across these other things, but I will say that the thing about Project Drawdown's list is they are really thinking about the really solving the most potent greenhouse gases first and working their way down. And some of these may not sound like they're super specific, but I'll go ahead and go through them. So their number one, the number one thing that we need to do in order to stop runaway climate change is um, focus on improving refrigeration. And now that doesn't sound like something that an individual would be able to work on very much. It's because it has something that's being, being done by the companies that make refrigeration and cooling units. But I will say this, as I was looking into it a little bit more, sort of thinking you might be asking me about that, um, is that if you have a refrigerator or an, um, an air conditioning system that's seven years old or younger than that, that you've put it in in the past seven years, you're probably okay in that it will, because um, it, it you're as it's using the newer kind of refrigerants that aren't as bad for the environment when they leak. However, you want to be sure to maintain that refrigerator. Again, this sounds like something that not very many people could do. So I would almost encourage you if you do feel drawn to doing that, it would be great to do that for free for your friends and neighbors because it makes a really huge difference because those kinds of gases are so point per, uh, are so potent. So that's number one. Number two is onshore wind power. So that means actively supporting wind power projects when they come up. Again, probably not something that everybody can do um, in, in an easy way or find a way to entry, but maybe some people on this can. Number three is reducing food waste. Um, there are a lot of reasons why wasted food uh, produce, I mean, agriculture in general produces a lot of greenhouse gases. So by reducing food waste, the amount of land used for agriculture can eventually become smaller. That's the one that I decided to take on. It was number three. I couldn't see myself doing anything about refrigeration. I wasn't sure about wind power, but I could do, I could work on that because I'm the person in the household that procures the food. I go to the grocery store. I mostly prepare the food. Uh, I'm the one that stores the food that there are leftovers to be stored and thinks about ways to reuse them. So that was something that I could have control over. And it's made, made a big difference in how I how I root, uh, run my life. I will say one little thing in case you choose that one too, is one thing that has taught me to do is because I rarely, when I go out for a business lunch, I rarely eat the whole meal because it's just too much food. I now bring my own rather conspicuous little containers with me to the restaurant and set that aside in those. Um, and sometimes people will ask me about it and it gives a chance to talk about food waste. Number four is plant-rich diets. Um, I think there's been a lot of publicity about the advantages of, of decreasing the amount of meat in one's diet, um, going to plants. Number five is tropical forest protection. Again, something not that, that, that many people here could do. Number six is an interesting one, educating girls. Um, and by that, they mean about really thinking about places where girls receive very little education because once they do, family sizes tend to be smaller. They tend to participate in decision-making. And you can look at the others as well. Um, but it's going to need, you're going to need to think about like how you fit into one of those, in one of those categories. Number 10 is rooftop solars. Maybe you live someplace where you can install rooftop solar or perhaps pay for somebody else to do it that has the right kind of roof. Uh, yeah, that's what those, those are some of the things on there. Jill, I want to go right to what I imagine may 
feel or seem like a bit of a controversial position. Um, can you talk about the relative impact of something that many of us already do, like recycling versus um, doing some uh, carbon off offset activities? Mm -hmm. um, I will say recycling is really low on Project Drawdown's list. Um, I think it's like 60th um, and doesn't mean that it, it doesn't help. However, um, that issue has gotten really complicated because there's no place for our recyclables to go anymore. They used to go on big barges to China. So many things that you put in the recycling aren't getting recycled anymore anyway, because there's no way to pay for it. Somebody would, uh, you know, would require an enormous amount of money coming from somewhere, probably from government, for those things to be recycled. And then there's some controversy about the, the amount of energy that goes into recycling. Glass in particular is really heavy. Um, you might have noticed in grocery stores that they've stopped putting things in, drawer, drawer, in jars as much, and they're putting them in very flimsy, kind of uh, sort of a plastic-based or um, uh, containers, which seem like they'd be terrible for the environment instead of glass, but actually are better for the environment. So that one's complicated. Um, always recycle your metal though. Metal is very energy efficient in terms of recycling. So make sure you recycle your metal pans. We have a few questions from the audience here um, related to carbon offsets. So I'm just gonna group them. Um, one question is, I have read and heard that some carbon offsets are bogus or fake. How do you find something that really matters? So I suppose that means how do you find a place to get your carbon offsets that's gonna be legit? And then a follow-up question from someone else is where can I buy a carbon offset credit? Okay, great. Um, so I should give a full disclosure on this before I answer that question because my husband is in that business. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Um, um, however, the fact that he is in that business has given me a chance to really see it close up and then examine it close up. Um, and I think that what I, where I've, uh, so you're not wrong about that. Some of these um, uh, offset credits have not been exactly what they were cracked up to be. There are lots of rules within it about additionality and sometimes um, things slip through that crack and something that might've happened anyway gets treated as a credit. It's not a perfect system. However, it is a very, very good system. So um, my daughter the other day when we were following Google Maps, she said, you know, mom, I'm starting to realize like, you know, oftentimes like you do get that wrong turn in Google Maps, but it's more, more like a recipe. Like you're, you know, you, you, it requires some interpretation. And I think that carbon credits are somewhat like that as well. Uh, most of them are excellent and superb and have, have practiced, have crossed, crossed every T and dotted every I. There are some that slip through the cracks that seem egregious. Um, but that doesn't mean the whole system is bad and it's getting better and better all the time. Um, uh, there's, they're use, starting to use blockchain technology, which is essentially, essentially becomes like a ledger. So you can track the whole history of the, um, of the carbon offset project, um, in a, in a better way. Um, so the technology around that of tracking them and making sure that they are in the excellent category and doing exactly what they said to is getting better all the time. It will continue to get better, frankly, if people continue to buy offset credits because it'll show a greater and greater need for that um, and a greater need for that investment. So it's not impossible that, um, say, if you offset your credit, it's not impossible that somebody might waste 5% of that um, doing it on something that would have happened anyway. And that would be, in your word, bogus. Um, but that doesn't mean it's still not doing good. Um, so. Um, I, you know, in case you're interested in my husband's company, it's called Tradewater.us. Um, Tradewater is the name of it, and it, they they're one of the ones that are working on refrigerants. Um, they collect and destroy those old kinds of refrigerants and um, take uh, carbon credits for that. Um, and but there are there are a lot of other companies out there too. And I think in general, um, they're probably uh, you know they're probably all good. It's not like there's some company out there that's really trying to trick everybody. Um, related because you did just um, uh, reference refrigerants and, um, you know, this is, you know, one of or perhaps the most important um, uh, issue to tackle. There's these things that keep our houses clean and are uh, cool and our 
cars cool and kind of make make our lives livable, our climates livable, um, what are we supposed to do about um, refrigerants? Well, I was talking about that a little bit earlier, um, but I can go into that a little bit more. Um, uh, yeah, so I think refrigerants are a little bit hard for somebody to tackle. Um, but improvements in the type of refrigerants that have been used have been happening gradually over the last 20 years ago. And the reason um, Project Iron is so worried about them is that these kinds, of, they, they are many, many times more potent and detrimental to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, and even much more dangerous than uh, methane is. Um, and that's why they're such a high priority, because if we don't get those done, uh, that th there's a, a belief with and a scientific evidence within that community that if the refrigerants thing isn't taken care of, that we really don't have any hope in terms of fighting climate change. That's why they're number one. Um, so yeah, if you have a new air conditioning system in your home and new refrigerators, you're fine as you are because those refrigerants use much less, have much less effect on global warming. And where you are now is as good as it gets. Those newer HFCs have lower uh, greenhouse, um, produce lower greenhouse gases and contribute less to global warming. The best strategy for mitigating their impact is to reduce your overall um, air conditioning and refrigeration usage. Um, and um, uh, again, like if you've it's been the last seven years, it's probably okay. At 10 or 11 years, it starts to be questionable. One thing you could do would be to take a look at your manual um, that came with the appliance. You could also look at the labels on the appliance and it should tell you the type of refrigerant that's on it. You could also contact the manufacturer directly. Um, and the other thing is maintaining, maintaining it is really, really important. Air conditioning systems that are in perfect shape actually don't aren't emitting any hydrofluorocarbons because they're operating efficiently. Um, but it's also normal because of entropy that leaks do occur over time, and those leaks will increase the HFCs in the atmosphere. So just keep them in excellent working order. Yeah, and again, like if you like doing that kind of thing and you get kind of good at it, offer to do that same service for your friends and family, because lots of us would find that all to be very confusing. Um, we have a couple questions that I'm going to sort of group together. Um, that uh, I think are coming off of when you referenced sort of how peer-to-peer -peer influence is really the main way um, people make these sorts of changes and that ComEd had rolled out this um, new feature where they compare uh, your bill to your neighbors. Um, I have one person that says they can't find it on their bill. I'll go ahead and just say, I just logged onto my ComEd account. I'm looking at it now. And on the right hand side under my insights, there is a link I can click that says compare my usage to my neighbors. And unfortunately I am using 55% more electricity than my neighbors. So I I suppose I suppose I could blame that on working at home and doing all these Zooms. Uh, <laughs> I'm so ashamed. How can I even be hosting this? So um, yes. So it is there, uh, not, is what you're saying. It's it is still present on the comment bills. At yeah. least, um, at least when I log in online, I'm not looking at my paper bill. So it may be there as well. I I remember seeing it there in the past, but I'm on my account online. Um, another comment related question is um, someone's asking. They get a lot of solicit uh, solicitations to switch um, their their energy to some re renewable entity. And how do you know which one to choose? I've wondered that too. I'm sorry to say I haven't researched that and I don't have any information on that. I'm so sorry, I wish I did. It's a good question. Um, let me just scroll through the questions coming in. Um, can you comment on any current tax incentives that people can use to improve their home's efficiency? No, I'm sorry, I don't know. That's also a great question. I wish somebody else knew the answer and could tell us. I don't know. Especially me at 55% more than my neighbors. <laughs> um, okay, uh, here's one. Um, you know, everyone's got an uncle that they see at Thanksgiving that perhaps is a climate change skeptic. Um, and maybe even if they believe or acknowledge that climate change um, is a thing, they still 
are skeptical uh, about the impact of humans on climate change. If you were in that situation, Jill, you're at Thanksgiving, and I've been at Thanksgiving with you. Um, what do you do? What do you say to Uncle Jerry about um, about his climate change skepticism and and the influence of humans on that? Well, I don't think there's one blanket answer for that. I think it really depends on your human to human relationship with that person. You know better than I do whether what were you calling him, Uncle Jerry or something? Jerry, like, Uncle, good old Uncle Jerry. Uncle Jerry, of course, Uncle Jerry. So you know your relationship with Uncle Jerry. If Uncle Jerry is baiting you and just wants to get a rise out of you, I would start talking about how pretty the sunset is and completely ignore it altogether because you're not gonna make any headway with Uncle Jerry. You know how we're talking about that group of things you can control and the things that you that are outside of your control and that the things that are outside of your control, just don't even spend time even thinking about them because you've got a precious resource of your mental energy. Focus on the things that you have, so you, can, you can affect some change in. Um, and if Uncle Jerry isn't one of them, I would just completely ignore him. If if Uncle Jerry is somebody that loves you and is actually interested in what you what your views are, and you can have a conversation with him, I would do some really deep listening of uh, why he thinks the way he thinks. Don't just assume that he's ready to just absorb all of your lessons when as you pound them down his throat. Um, uh, you know, find out a little bit about where he's coming from and, and you'll feel your way in it. I feel confident that the people on this call are caring people um, with a lot of experience. Also, because the most people on the call are older adults, we have a lot of experience in reading people and understanding people and really use that superpower of yours um, to come to bear when it comes to the Uncle Jerry's in your life. Thank you for the Uncle Jerry tips. Um, all right, I'm scrolling through. We have lots more questions. I'm seeing someone actually answering in the chat our energy bill question. Apparently, um, when it comes to your house, if you're still getting your bills mailed to you, it is a separate sheet of paper from your bill, but I it appears to be in the same envelope. So somewhere in there, um, you should see some comparison, but I know you can see it online because I just looked at mine. Um, all right, let's see what we got here. Um, a lot of folks, Jill, are asking for some more specific direction about how and where to buy offset credits. And I'm assuming if you go to Project Drawdown, you can find guidance on that. I don't think so, because they're not going to be advertising any of those uh, providers. Um, okay. I, so... Um, I because I know Tradewater and I offset my business through Tradewater. I actually don't know the names of the other companies. I don't think it would take too much though to maybe find out what the top five biggest ones are. I would probably go with a you know I probably oh oh I know actually the Atlantic did a I think the Atlantic Monthly did something on this recently of which ones are the best ones. Maybe that's it. That maybe that would be a good idea to, uh, to think of a, a publication that you really like and someplace that you really respect and get advice from on um, and see if they and Google um, best companies to purchase offset uh, credits from. Um, and um, that would be a more curated list. Okay. So we have hit an hour. Um, we're going to go a little bit longer or maybe 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and I will try to get to as many of your questions as I can. They are coming in fast and furious we have dozens. Shane, um, what about this one about the contributing money to a conservation organization as a way to offset one's carbon footprint? Um, how about it? One, I thought that one was kind of interesting. Um, I think it's a really great one. Um, I think the thing that's different, so I'm not going to say no to that. I think that whatever you do is going to be great. Um, I think the one thing that's different about the carbon footprint is it's a little bit more of a neutral transaction in that essentially you're paying someone to do something for you. You're not donating money to somebody. You're actually paying them to provide a service for you. And that service is to decrease the amount of greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere. So in my mind, I have those in two separate categories. And again, you'll come up with your own formulation of that, but the carbon offset is different. Um, we have a, a few questions about wind power and windmills. Um, 
I don't know what your level of expertise on that is, Jill. One question asks, um, what do you think of wind powers? They kill an enormous number of birds. Birds are disappearing. Um, let's take them one at a time. That's the first one. Yeah. You know what? I hate that too. You know, when I was going through that list, I kind of skimmed over wind power and got to food waste. The third one that was wind power was number two, I think. And what food waste was number three, which was the one I did. I deliberately didn't do anything myself about wind power because I feel the same way you feel about wind power. I, um, I mean, I do, I do support it conceptually. However, I was on the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission um, for a number of years, and um, oftentimes those wind farms were going in close to where nature preserves were that have a lot of birds and attract a lot of migrating birds. So, for me personally that wouldn't be the issue that I would pick off of project drawdowns list to work on. Um, and, you know, again, it's a personal choice, but it is considered to be a really high priority to move toward more wind power. I think that that showed up before solar because in part um, because of that exchange of how much greenhouse gas emissions it really change, uh, transfers. So that was my personal feeling. And again, like I think when you're making your decisions, do the ones that resonate the most with you and where you feel you can be effective. Um, and then a, a related state sticking on wind power. Um, we have a question. Uh, it's been shown that painting tur the turbines a dark color substantially reduces the amount of birds who are killed. Why is this not mandated universally and what can be done to require this simple change? That's fascinating. I hadn't heard that, um, but that that's super interesting. Um, I mean, that would definitely, we're talking about local involvement. I mean, you have state senators and state representatives who, who um, could influence that sort of a piece of legislation in Illinois. Um, I would definitely start talking to your uh, representatives on that. Um, and I also, I'm just going to take note of that as something new that I learned from this. I hadn't heard that, um, but I believe you. And I think that sounds like a great idea. Maybe it will be mandated soon. Um, I need to um, celebrate and acknowledge this question that comes from someone I work with, Ella Cantor, who's not even an older adult yet. Um, where does Project Drawdown rank energy consumption? How can we reduce energy consumption on an individual level day to day? Um, well, Project Drawdown is talking about these big categories. So it does, it's, and then I'm, my recommendation is that you figure out your individual place within that. Um, so um, I don't know exactly where it ranks in Project Drawdowns. Uh, certainly that would be a great thing to do as your one thing um, to reduce your energy consumption, to start biking to work, to start maybe taking an electric bike for your errands, to um, to walk, to use ma mass transit. If you're a two car household, see if you can go down to being a one car household in general, like anything on reducing energy. Generally, it's a great idea if you change something about the infrastructure of how you live. Um, because that what has the most impact on how much energy you use. So people in New York City actually live very, very environmentally sustainable lives um, because they don't use as much water, electricity, um, uh, gas for transportation, et cetera, as anyone else in the country. So if you move to, um, you know, if you move to a transit friendly community, um, that might make a huge difference. Um, um, so I think that's great to focus on energy reduction. Sure, that would be an excellent one. It's super direct also, right? Because every time you're driving, you're emitting, um, you know, you're emitting carbon dioxide. Um, we have two, uh, well, I guess one is a question and one is um, more of, I guess, an explanation um, about uh, uh, third act. Do you know what that is, Jill? No. Mm -mm. Okay. So I'll just voice the question and also voice what um, someone wrote in about third act. One person asks, uh, I have been enjoying participation in third act. Do you think enough seniors know about it? Um, and then the next one explains what third act is because it's new to me. Third act is building a community of Americans over the age of 60 determined to change the world for the better. Together, we use seniors' life experience, skills, and resources to build a better tomorrow. 
Climate Change Makers provides a clear roadmap for people to take action, advocate for bold, science-based, equitable climate solutions, then get on with your week. So there is a little plug for Third Act. I hope it turns out to be a good organization. I haven't just promoted something um, awful. It sounds fantastic. Sounds uh, awesome, doesn't it? Sounds it? Oh my gosh. I'm going to look it up immediately after this. And I'm certainly going to add that to my list of recommendations, especially since it's coming the, from this group. Um, uh, that sounds, I mean, it sounds, it, it sounds fantastic. And I love the name too. And then another re related person says, how about climate change makers? I don't know if that is um, a, a sub uh, offshoot of third act or it's its own thing. Do you know about them, Jill? I don't. Okay. Um, I uh, wanted to ask you, Jill, um, is there anything that is uh, that, that we can all do that is sort of Chicago area specific? You know, like mm -hmm. there's different different situations all over the country, different um, environments people live in. Is there anything specific to our area um, that that uh, we should bear in mind? Such a good question. I did work on the uh, Chicago, the city of Chicago's climate action plan last year. And one of the interesting conversations we were having is the fact that Chicago is likely to be a place that uh, what they're calling climate migrants will come to from the, the dry parts of the United States, flooded coasts of the United States, uh, possibly from other nations because we have such a large fresh water supply. And that one of the things that the sh Chicago area towns and cities could do to prepare for climate change is to think about how we handle incoming migrants in a way that's gracious, warm, welcoming, and is very good for our own cities and our city's developments. Um, city of Chicago actually has been in a period of population decline. So presumably we do have room to bring new people in. And how would we do that in an orderly way, in a way where we're expecting them rather than it being an emergency? Like, a, oh, it's a huge surprise, like not letting it be a huge surprise, but something you're plan, you're plan for. Another thing I would say too, is that when you're thinking about what to do for the environment, one thing that we used to always say in Chicago that I, frankly is not as important to worry about here is water conservation. Um, that's not to say there aren't some consequences to using city water. I mean, there is energy that's exerted in order to purify it and treat it and so forth and handle the sewage. Um, but uh, in general, the, the, the predictions for the Chicago metropolitan area in terms of climate are that we're going to be having more precipitation rather than less. That precipitation might be coming to us in bigger, shorter weather events rather than gentle rains. Um, so there may be storms involved. Um, but the wa fresh water, given that we're in the Great Lakes, is probably not going to be a huge issue for us. So if you want something that you can drop off your list a little bit, if you've been making sure you turn off the water every time you brush your teeth, I'm not saying not to keep doing that, but it might be something you don't have to worry about quite as much. Another thing you might think about also in the future is unfinishing your basement. Um, it's likely that we will have more flooding over time. And if that water has somewhere to go, um, that's not destructive to your home, that might be an advantage for you in the future. So um, possibly providing um, on, the, on the Evanston level or on the level of the town or city that you live in, perhaps providing some incentives for people to unfinish their basements so that there's not these constant payouts for damage from flooding. I love um, some of the things coming in. We are crowdsourcing uh, answers to some of these questions as we go. So we have a couple of questions that are following up on wind turbines and also following up on the third act. So um, third act first, third act is Bill McKibben's project. Um, third act is great, tell everyone, climate change makers is separate from third act, also good. So great. fantastic, thank you for sending that in. And then um, a follow up on the turbine question. Um, I attended a meeting of the USFW Sierra Club. I'm not sure what that USFW stands for, but anyway, the Sierra Club and some other groups, and they were proposing better wind turbines that do not kill birds and bats. And apparently the uh, one solution is just painting one blade a darker color seems to have a big impact. So a little follow-up. Thank you for the crowdsourcing, you all. Um, 
what else? Um, I I kind of want to know a little bit more, Jill, about how did you get started in all this? Was there like an, you know, I know you went to Northwestern and that you started working in these, um, you know, for some of these environmental nonprofits right out of school. Was there like an aha moment or a, a transformational experience that sort of headed you off in this direction and doing this kind of work? Um. Thanks for asking that little question of my personal history, even though we're friends, I don't think we've ever talked about that before. Um, I was always somebody interested in nature. I grew up in a very rural part of America um, and um, where I was surrounded by nature. Um, almost immediately though, when I got to Chicago, I was looking on maps about where the forest preserves were and I'd get on the bus at Northwestern and just go randomly down, take the Dempster bus way out to go out to the Labaugh Woods. Um, it's Laba, no, um, the, the Miami woods, um, prairie that's, um, out right on that, right on that street, um, and, um, poking around and looking at nature. So I think nature was my gateway. I was uh, very interested in nature. I was interested in learning the names of the plants and learn then, cause I was, got the job at the nature conservancy. I became even more interested in protecting biodiversity. So, um, that was something that I always had a, a strong interest in. So it wasn't one aha moment. I mean, my family was interested in it too. So speaking toward leadership, um, the leadership of passing on that to other young people, um, uh, I think influenced me to be interested in it. And then the shift to caring about climate was obviously a very natural shift to make. And then, you know, perhaps a related question um, to the to if you had an aha moment, which it sounds like it wasn't quite like that. But have, on the flip side, have you ever had just a moment of crushing despair and hopelessness um, in your in your time working in this field? I have had moments of despair. But I have managed not to be crushed by them. And rather than recount the moments when I did feel a sense of despair, I will say something on that subject in general. And that is that I teach at an institution where I'm around a lot of people who are in their early 20s. And then the graduate students range from mid-20s to into their thirties and sometimes even forties or fifties. But um, the people that are coming up that generation care deeply, deeply about climate. It is not a remote subject to them. When I first started teaching there and I would um, have people write something about nature, I always felt like I was pulling them way off topic of what they're interested in. They are very interested in that. And I feel I think it's my general optimism about how smart and kind this upcoming generation is and how caring they are that makes me not feel crushed. Okay. Um, a bunch of sort of related questions and I'm gonna try to group them all together and hopefully they make sense grouped together, but basically questions related to, does it matter if I do X or does it matter if I do okay. Y? So let's okay. try to tackle a few of those. Okay. Um, uh, I know you mentioned curbside recycling is often not recycled. What about plastic bags, um, film that is dropped off at stores? Is that any better? I would like to know the answer to that question. So I'd love for whoever it is to research that. I think not because I just, uh, the, you know, that kind of plastic is not very easy to recycle. The plastic that is most likely to so recycled are the kind that are in bottles like water bottles and soda bottles, that kind of pal plastic. I've heard before that, in fact, if you put that kind of plastic of the grocery bags into the conventional recycling machines and it tangles up the machinery in Chicago on my blue bin, I get those notices every so often, like, oh, this entire load is going to be dumped because you put a plastic bag in there. So I don't know the answer to it, but I am suspicious about whether those flat bags that we sometimes drop off, sometimes grocery stores will have a place for you to deposit them. I would be surprised if they're doing anything but throwing them away, frankly. So um, again, I know this is sort of a sacred cow for some people, but is it just fair to say, just blanket that recycling is is not as effective as we we might hope and it, people's energy may be better spent 
doing something else if it's an either or decision? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, another sort of is this uh, is this helpful sort of question is uh, I turn my car engine off instead of idling whenever possible. Um, that's is that important? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that makes that a difference. Work. Mm -hmm. And you'll often see that for like buses and places where school buses park and that kind of thing. But it's true for any any vehicle. Um, better to have it off than than running. And I I actually recently had to buy a car because our uh, our Honda CRV from two thousand eight had two hundred fifty thousand miles on it, and I was surprised because our new car turns itself off whenever we stop, like even mm -hmm. at a stop mm -hmm. sign or stoplight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's um, very, very important. That's a good thing to do. Okay. Um, and then I, I really feel for this next question, why is it always on the citizen or the individual and not the focus on industry um, as the primary creator of plastic waste and pollution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that's a great question. Um, and I, I, everything that's also implicit in that, of that feeling like, are you kidding me? Like we're already doing so much. And then, you know, here you are trying to tidy up this one little element of your world. And then you find out about something that's being done over here on this huge scale, um, that again, you don't have any control over, like, why isn't anybody stopping them making those things change? Um, so I feel like an emotion implicit in that, that I really share also. Um, I think it is on those companies, those industries, um, to make those changes. Um, I think that the ways to do that are multiple. There's actually been sort of an interesting thing happening in the investing world. So people might know about ESG investing, which is environment, social and governance, um, and rewarding companies that um, are good on those things by investing in them. However, in addition to that, there's also this new movement around um, certain funds that are those kinds of ESG funds are actually thinking, well, why are we giving companies like Goldman Sachs, which aren't big polluters anyway, you know, credit for being green companies. Well, their operations are green because they're not in charge of making fertilizers and mm -hmm. chemicals and steel that we frankly still need in order to have safe roads and bridges and all those things. So yes, of course they're green because they don't do anything anyway. Like the place to really get the get down on, to, to get working on climate is with the companies that are the oil companies and the coal companies and the, the companies that are in, got involved in heavy industry. So there was a firm called um, something like Engine 54 um, and they bought, uh, it was a relatively small investing firm, but we'd call it a hedge fund or an investing pool that um, they only owned $34 million worth of Exxon Mobil stock, which is so tiny. It's a tiny, tiny amount, but they became activist stakeholders and they managed through their efforts as state as shareholders to be able to get three seats on the Exxon Mobil board turned over. And I think that's a really interesting kind of activism where you don't just discount those, what they're called brown companies, but find a way to engage in them in such a way that changes get made in those because that's where you really start diminishing the amount of emissions that are going into the atmosphere. Like frankly, like just continuing to invest in companies that are already pretty green because they're not doing that stuff probably isn't having that much of an effect on an environment as it would if some of those firms that are trying to um, improve the environment would invest in some of those brown companies and then become just even moderately active. Like that's not very active to own $34 million worth of stock, but it means talking to people. It means doing that kind of like old time politics in a way where you kind of go door to door and have personal conversations with people like, oh, I think this is in the best interest of the company. You know, um, what do you think? Um, so that I, I found that to be interesting and encouraging. Not that I'm in a position to do that, but some people are. One more sort of does this matter type of question. Um, driving versus flying. Um, where do you fall on the either or? And if you, for example, choose to drive instead of fly, does that make any sort of difference on an individual level? That's a great question. 
that's the kind of thing that I'd probably at this point with artificial intelligence existence, I would probably like type that into chat GPT and ask them that question. Is it really good at like ferreting out answers like that, that are kind of math questions like that? I don't know. I think it's going to depend on so many different factors of, um, you know, what the traffic conditions are like and the weather conditions are like. I, I don't think there's one easy blanket answer to that question. Um, and I don't know right off the top of my head, like if there's a, a website or an app that will calculate that for you. I do know that sometimes, do you ever get this? I think it's on Apple Maps rather than Google Maps. They will tell you what the most fuel efficient way is to your route. You see that little leaf come up when you're Googling mm -hmm. your directions or going on i think it's apple maps right that does that and they'll say that. you lose you use less fuel if you're um uh, if for the route for driving so that's helpful um but i don't know i do think it's a really important thing to offset your carbon on those sites when you have that chance when american airlines asks do you want to offset the carbon for this trip to say yes to that in part because it's showing the interest of consumers in that and that they that the consumers want that um, I also do that for any package that I order, even though I offset the carbon carbon already for our household. I do that additional just to show people care um, and there's a need for that. So um, these aren't all explicitly questions for you, Jill, but there are a lot of folks writing in to recommend resources where folks can find out more. And I'll, I'll just say up front that Jill and I have not um, fact checked any of these recommendations. So I um, can't speak to um, the credibility, but let me just share them on the assumption that uh, they are in fact what they suggest they are. So one is faith in place, um, a, a place people can go online uh, to learn about the Inflation Reduction Act, Incentives for Improving Cars and Homes. Uh, Faith in Place serves congregations, but their info applies to individuals as well. So one potential resource is Faith in Place. Um, another resource that someone writes in about, uh, Jane Fonda has a climate show on Fridays at 1 p.m. on, uh, I believe this is Facebook book. It's called Firehouse Fridays. Another That's resource. Great, I love that. Yeah. Um, uh, another person is writing in to say this site tells the average number of miles driven in each state per year. So if you want to see um, if your state is a, uh, a perhaps a, a big uh, automobile polluter. That's at thezebra.com and you can look up average miles driven per year. Um, another person writes in to say, I hope everyone knows about the Illinois Solar for All program. Do you know about that, Jill? Mm -mm. So I'm okay. glad to know. Thank Presumably you. Presumably it's some sort of um, credit uh, for going solar uh, in your home. Um, let's see if there's any other crowdsourced recommendations. Well, a bunch of folks are still asking about where can I find ways to make um Credit, uh, carbon offsets. And the only one I know for certain that Jill, you know, as well is Trade Water, um, which is the company that Jill's husband uh, is the, in, the head of. Um, I don't know other resources. Do you, Jill? I don't know them off the top of my head. So I'd be just Googling them the same as you would be. Um, Trade Water is Chicago based too, which is kind of nice. So I um, actually have worked with Trade Water a little bit and it's a very funny job. Basically, my job was to go around with a big envelope full of money and fly off to um, find people with tanks of outdated refrigerant, which is the worst kind. Is it R12, Jill? Yeah, R12. R12 refrigerant, which has been uh, outlawed for you know, decades, I think, but people still have it. And I would go and I would give them money on the spot to take their tank of R12 <laughs> and travel with it back to Chicago where it would be incinerated um, and thus taken out of the, um, the system so that it couldn't cause greenhouse gas. So basically paying people to turn in their polluting R12. Um, I once bought refrigerant from a man not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> this was in Mississippi, I think. 
<laughs> um, okay, <laughs> but onward. Um, Jill, I this is slightly off topic, but I'm just so curious. What's the deal with that mushroom you found? How did that happen? And what did you name it? <laughs> How did you find your own mushroom that had never previously been known? Well, I got really interested in the fact that only 20% of all life on earth had ever been named or I, I found named and described by science. And I was like, oh, maybe I could help with that. I could find something. Um, I'm going to make this long story short. Basically, I ended up uh, sort of apprenticing myself to two different groups at the Field Museum of Natural History where they have scientists who discover things. One was with Larry Heaney, who has discovered 30 new species of mammals, if you can imagine that, on the planet Earth, um, uh, in the mostly in the Philippines. Um, and I did a trip out there to the Philippines. And the other was the, with the mycology department, which is mushrooms. And um, they had some mushrooms that they thought were probably new species, but nobody there had the time to do um, the work of uh, measuring all the spores under the microscopes and making the comparison. So they taught me how to do that. And I did that for them and sure enough, and then we did the DNA work on it, um, which we did in conjunction with Chicago Botanic Garden. And it did in fact turn out to be a new mushroom and it got named the Chicago Chanterelle, Cantarellus chicagoensis. Can I, is it possible for me to find one of these and can I eat it? Yes. Okay. We're, like we're, a true mushroom person, I will not tell you where. I will not you tell have you. your own secret little stash. Is, right? Okay. <laughs> um, that's probably going to do it for us. If Jill, if there was, is there one more point I haven't asked you about? One more question you'd, you'd like to speak to that maybe hasn't come across yet? think so. I just hope that people leave this encouraged. Um, and I do hope that maybe people would just maybe set aside if it's something that's been a relatively small issue for you. It sounds like some of you are already doing great things. The fact that you know so much about it already is really inspiring to me and has given me new information. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, and for those of you who maybe are just getting your feet wet with it, yeah, just maybe just put it in your calendar to do 90 minutes of research this week on the on the, some of the things that you picked up from that, either from what was in the in the chat and the question and answers or things that I had to say um, and follow up on it. So you can reach that place where you feel like you, you not just feel you actually are being genuinely infect, affected uh, at fighting climate change. Um, thank you so much, Jill. Um, for everyone out there, I just want everyone to um pat themselves on the back a little bit. We had uh, over 60 questions come in and I believe over 150 people log in to hear this talk. So great participation from all of you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Kathy, for helping us with our technical difficulties and for everyone bearing with us. Um, I'm Shane Dubow and we will do this again soon. Bye. Bye.